Heavenly Father, we bless your name for bringing us here today. We praise you because of your goodness. You have kept us alive so that we can glorify you. And we pray that what we hear today would lead us to glorify you more in our lives in Jesus' name. We pray that you will grant us the grace to be humble enough to take everything that you teach us from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Today we want to look at one of the landmarks in the Christian faith. The days in which we are living are days of compromise, days of deviating from the important cardinal teachings of the word of God. And yet we have been instructed in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 28. Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have said. God himself addressed to up people that we refer to now as our fathers in the faith. We are referred to as children of Abraham by faith. And the Christian heritage, the moral values and the moral standards that were given have come from God through such patriarchs and fathers and prophets and kings, apostles and teachers that were discovered in the Bible. God himself has preserved for us values that are timeless, doctrines that are changeless, and that will usher us into life eternal. And here is the commandment that we're given. Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have said. The tendency of preachers and churches today in these last days is to deny the Lord and deny the doctrines of Christ. There are lots of doctrines that are being denied today. But that's not strange. Because Jesus Christ himself warned the believers before he left that a time of change a time of compromise, a time of falling away will come upon us. But he said, he that endures to the end, he that keeps on holding to the end, the same shall be saved. In Matthew chapter 24, from verse 11. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. False prophets are rising up today, and they are denying the teachings of the Lord and the foundations of Bible truth. Some deny the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Others doubt Christ's sinless life. Still there are others that will not fully receive the revelation of the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. These are false prophets that are coming up in the last days. And Jesus said they will deceive very many people. There are others who do not believe that it is possible, that it is even necessary for believers today to live clean, righteous, pure, and holy lives. Some are not looking forward to the rapture of the church. The second coming of Christ has no impact upon them, makes no impression on their faith. Neither do they ever think of Christ's millennial reign. And of course there are multitudes that do not believe in the eternal punishment of the unsaved in hell fire. These are the people that Jesus spoke about that in the last days they will arise and they will put doubt in these cardinal teachings of the word of God. In Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, 
the son of perdition. Here the apostle makes it very clear that a time of falling away is coming upon this world. And a time has come already when many preachers, writers, teachers, so-called prophets will deny the basis of our Christian faith that have been established by Jesus Christ himself, by his immediate apostles and disciples, and by the fathers and leaders of the church that followed after them. So whenever you see this all around you, in religious circles, that there is a falling away from the holy standard, the high standard we read of in the Bible, do not be shaken, do not be surprised, because it was so said long ago that such a time will come. In Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Peter mentioned this part, that even in the past, there were false prophets among the people. And then he said that in the future, that is the days and the times in which we are living now, there shall be false teachers. They will bring in damnable heresies, false doctrines. They will start slowly and privately, cleverly, but eventually, ultimately, they will be denying the Lord and the things that Jesus Christ himself taught so plainly and so clearly. But then the judgment is that sweet destruction will come upon them. You might say, if anybody comes to teach, denying what Jesus Christ taught very, very plainly, nobody will follow, nobody will be deceived, nobody will be sidetracked. But verse 2 says, And many shall follow the pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Already you know that is happening today, that the way of truth, the way of Bible doctrine, is not being spoken against in many circles. And they will say, we know many Bible teachers, and many church leaders, and many religious um, leaders that are not teaching as you are teaching from the Word of God. They have accommodated all the weaknesses and frailties of human lives and human nature. And they have told us this and that. Yes, we are not surprised, because it says many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with pained words make merchandise of you. That is, in order to get money out of you, they will not be able to tell you the truth. They will gloss over the truth, hide the truth, so they can make merchandise of their audiences and their congregations, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. In chapter 3 of Second Peter, this second epistle, beloved, I write unto you, in both which I stop your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles, of the Lord and Savior. Peter said, you must remain mindful of the words that have been spoken and written by the holy prophets, and of the commandments of the apostles of the Lord, knowing this post, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. What are we to do? In the midst of the changing doctrines of men, in the midst of the dangers of compromise around us, what are we supposed to do? Jude, verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered 
unto the saints. Here we are instructed and commanded that as we see the last days upon us, we are not to struggle with the people of the world concerning political position. That's not what we are to honestly contend for. Neither are we to struggle to maintain a social status. That's not the priority on our list. Neither are we to bother ourselves with national recognition. That is not the major thing. You know the major thing? As people around us are removing the landmarks, as people around us are denying the Lord, and denying the doctrines of the Lord, we are to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. One of the major Bible doctrines you hardly hear anything about today in many places of worship, many so-called churches, is restitution. Preachers who preached it possibly before have declined talking about it now. And it takes faith, humility, and the experience of the mind of Christ before you can remain true to all the word of God. We are going to consider it today what the word of God teaches on restitution. And we need to open our hearts to the truth as we consider the subject in three major points. Number one, restitution before the law. Number two, restitution during the law. Number three, restitution after the law. Before, during, and after the law. What does the Bible reveal concerning restitution? Let's see the word of God concerning this subject before the law of Moses came in. There are many people as soon as they begin to hear the word of the Lord concerning restitution. Oh, they say, that's another part of the law of Moses. And since the law of Moses has been abolished, taken out of the way, gotten rid of, we're no more under that law. And they feel we're not supposed to talk anything, say anything about restitution today. They say once something is forgiven by the Lord, it's totally forgotten. Neither are you to make mention of it before God, before man, any time. But before the law of Moses came in, before Moses was even born, before the parents of Moses were born, before the grandparents of Moses were born, God himself had spoken to the people in that generation. Genesis chapter 20. And I'm reading from verse 1. And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country, and dwelt between Kadesh and Shaw, and sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech king of Gerar sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night, and said unto him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. And Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, She is my sister. And she, even she herself said, He is my brother. In the integrity of my heart, in the innocency of my hands, have I done this? Abimelech was pleading before the Lord, he was saying, I'm innocent of this. I was ignorant of the fact that this lady, this woman, belonged to a man. When I did it, I wasn't conscious of committing any sin. You know, many times in our lives, the things we did in the past, at the time we were doing them, because of the limited light we had got, because we had not read much of the Bible at the time, we felt innocent. We felt not guilty. We felt that we were doing the right thing. We felt in our own capacity and way, we had checked up all the details, and in all probability, we were doing right. But when the light of the gospel came, you discovered that thing you did, that you felt was right, you felt was nice, you felt you were innocent and righteous. Now God confirms it to be a sin, and He speaks to you about it. Verse 6, And God said unto him in a dream, 
Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart. For I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to torture. Now therefore, now therefore, forget your ignorance of the past now that the light has come. Now that the gospel has come your way. Now that the Almighty has spoken to you about it and he convinces you that this had been evil. Now therefore restore the man his wife. For he is a prophet and he shall pray for thee. And thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Here God himself revealed unto Abimelech. Remember, Abimelech was not a slave. He was not an illiterate, or uneducated, or enlightened man. He was the highest in that nation. He was a king. Which means then God is no respecter of persons. What he teaches the lowly, he teaches to those who are high. What he requires of the people that seem uneducated and unenlightened, he teaches the same thing to those who are enlightened and educated. And he told Abimelech and said, Restore that man his wife. Give him back his wife. Do not use your position as a king to hold on to the wife of another man. Verse 14. And Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham and restored him Sarah his wife. From the earliest of times, we learn that restitution was first revealed and preached by God himself. There was no written word for Abimelech to read. He didn't have a copy of the Bible like you and I have. Therefore God had to make a direct revelation unto him, the spoken word, and told him that restitution was necessary. And from this we learn that restitution is the restoring of anything to the rightful owner. When you've taken something not belonging to you, and now you have made peace with God, restitution means that you will not throw that thing away, you will not give that thing to a beggar, you will not give that, that thing to a needy person somewhere. You will restore that very thing to the rightful owner. Is that the only place in Genesis before the law of Moses where we have the teaching on restitution? Look at Genesis chapter 42 from verse 1. Now when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, and Jacob said unto his sons, Why do ye look upon one upon another? And he said, Behold, I have heard that there is corn in Egypt. Get you down thither, and buy for us from thence, that we may live and not die. And Joseph's ten brethren went down to Egypt to buy corn. Verse 25. And Joseph, then Joseph commanded to fill their sacks with corn and to restore every man's money into a sack and to give them provision for the way. And thus did he unto them. And he laded their asses with corn, and he parted thence. And as one of them opened a sack to give his ass provender in the inn, he espied his money. For behold, it was in his sack's mouth. Verse 35. And it came to pass, as they emptied their sacks, that behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when both they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. They went to buy corn. And whenever you buy anything, you normally pay money for it. But here they discovered something. That the money they were supposed to pay had been returned to their sacks. They didn't know that Joseph was being kind-hearted, they thought that somebody overlooked it. They thought they paid the money. But how could every one of us have made this mistake that we didn't pay the money we thought we paid? They became afraid. Now, not like people today that will just become happy and feel that, well, serves that other person right. I cheated him without knowing that I cheated him. 
I got all these bags of corn from that place. That was a great deal. A good contract. That I could get all this without even paying cover. And they will try to find out the method of cheating more. So they can repeat the same thing again. Not these people. In their hearts had been planted this timeless doctrine. Changeless doctrine of prostitution. What did they do? Genesis 43 from verse 1. And a famine was sore in the land. And it came to pass when they had eaten up the corn, which they had brought out of Egypt, that their father said unto them, Go again, buy us a little corn. Verse 11. And their father Israel said unto them, If it must be so now, do this. Take of the best fruits in the land, in your vessels, and carry down the man a present, a little bag, and a little honey, spices and myrrh, nuts and almonds, and take double money in your hand. And the money that was brought again in the mouth of your sacks, carry it again in your hand. For adventure, it was an oversight as restitution. The father instructed all of them that this is what they were to do. The money that had been returned to their sacks, and they had not fully paid what they had bought and what they had eaten. They must take that money and go and pay back that money. Then they must take another money with which they will buy new bags of corn. In verse 19, And they came near to the steward of Joseph's house, and they communed with him at the door of the house, and said, Oh, sir, we came indeed now the first time to buy food. And it came to pass, when we came to the inn, that we opened our sacks, and behold, every man's money was in the mouth of his sack, and money in full weight, and we have brought it again in our hand. That's restitution. Long before the law of Moses, they saw it was necessary for them to have a clear conscience between God and man that anything right way belonging to other people should be given to them. It was impressed on the human heart by God. It was an unshakable conviction within them before the law of Moses came that they were to make restitution. They knew that God was willing to forgive and to bless on condition that they were willing to have and to maintain a clear conscience. Guilt and condemnation will keep on haunting us until we accept to obey God. Now that was before the law of Moses. What happened during the law of Moses? Let's look at Exodus chapter 22. Verse 1. If a man shall steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. Isn't that restitution? He shall restore. He shall give back. From the person he has stolen from and cheated, he will not try to make the law to defend him and confirm or support his faith, but he will make restitution. If he wants peace with God, peace with man, in time and in eternity, he must do right. In verse 7, if a man shall deliver unto his neighbor money or stop to keep, and it be stolen out of the man's house, if the thief be found, let him pay double. Let him make restitution. And then in verse 14, if a man borrow aught of his neighbor, and it be hurt, or die, the owner thereof, be not with it, he shall surely make it good. When you live in any society like that, when if something belonging to you was stolen before, then the person who stole it, on the Sabbath day, he comes to sacrifice before the Lord. Then he remembers the word of the Lord. He goes to make his restitution. What was stolen from you during the week? The man that is approaching God comes to restore it to you. Oh, you'll say, this is good religion. That all the things that have been stolen from me, these people 
were instructed by God and the prophets and the priests and the lawgiver so that they will return everything to me. But what type of religion will that be? Where if something was stolen away from you, they are not supposed to return it to you. So they can keep on sinning, they can keep on taking your money, they can keep on stealing your property, and yet they will remain in favor with God. What type of religion will that be? But the pure religion that God gave to the children of Israel instructed that the thief will pay back again. In Leviticus chapter 6, from verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, This wasn't a decision from a committee. This wasn't a decision from a board of elders. This wasn't a doctrine that the board of trustees of a particular denomination formed out and wrote for their people this is the word of the lord and the lord spake unto moses saying if a soul sin and commit a trespass against the lord and lie to his neighbor in that which was delivered to him to keep and in fellowship or in fellowship or in a sin taken away by violence or has deceived his neighbor notice the method of taking that thing might have been different from the other it may be that it was given to you that you keep it and you lied about it. You were in fellowship, friendship with another person. You cheated him. Or you took it by violence. Or you took it by deception. Or, verse 3, have found that which was lost and lied concerning it and swears falsely in any of all these things that a man doeth sinning therein. Then it shall be. Because he has sinned, he is guilty. And he shall restore that which he took violently away, or the thing which he has deceitfully gotten, or that which was delivered him to keep, or the lost that he found. And so we know that during the law of Moses, it was expected that the people will make restitution. What happened after Moses died? And we came to the time of the judges and the prophets. What were they required to do at that time? First Samuel chapter 12, from verse 1. And Samuel said unto all Israel, Behold, I have hearkened unto your voice, and all that ye said unto me, and have made a king over you. And now, behold, the king walketh before you, and I am old and gray-headed. Behold, my sons are with you, and I have walked before you from my childhood unto this day. Behold, here I am, witness against me before the Lord, and before his anointed, whose ox have I taken, or whose ass have I taken, or whom have I defrauded, whom have I oppressed, or of whose hands have I received any bribe to blind mine eyes therewith, and I will restore it to you. This man came before the children of Israel and he said, I've been with you since I was very, very young. And I've been in the temple watching the light grow dim. And eventually, because of consecration and prayer, watching that light growing brighter. Now I'm old, aged, gray-headed. I'll soon be going. But I do not want anything to stand before me and Almighty God. When I come, in front of that gate that leads to heaven. And so that I will have a clear conscience between God and myself, and between you and myself, tell me before I go. Because I do not want this thing to stand before me when I appear in the presence of Almighty God. Have I defrauded anyone? Remind me if I'm forgetting, so I can restore before I go to meet God face to face. Have I stolen? Have I violently taken anything belonging to other people? Have I got any bribes from any of you to blind me when I judge? Remind me. And I will restore everything to you. And they said, Thou hast not defrauded us, nor oppressed us, neither hast thou taken out of any man's hand. So then you mean that I can go free and I can cross the river of death and appear before my God without any guilt, without any condemnation. They said, yes, you can go. That man had a free conscience. 
Now he knew he could make heaven. What shouldn't, why shouldn't we do that? And check up every time. As we see the days approaching. The days of the coming of the Lord approaching. And we know that after the Lord has come. And has taken the saints home. He will want to take an account from us. How we have spent our lives. Have we defrauded people? Cheated people? Stolen from people? Slandered people? Injured people? The son of Gera. He came forth and cursed seal as he came. And he cast stones at David. And all the servants of King David. And all the people and all the mighty men. Were on his right hand. And on his left. And thus said Shimei. When he cursed. Come out. Come out. Thou bloody man. Thou man of Belial. Then in verse 13. And as David and his men went by the way, Shimei went along on the hillside over against him and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and cast dust. This is a case of abuse, rebuke, reproach, slander. And it was a terrible time, a difficult time in the life of David. His own son, Absalom, had usurped the throne. He had been driven out. And Shimei, knowing of the difficulty of David, came out and started abusing him, cursing him. And David couldn't say anything. He handed over his case to the Lord. Now, you might have offended somebody who didn't fight back, who handed his case over to the Lord. And now you become a Christian. What are you going to do? Are you going to say because the fellow didn't take a lawyer, couldn't go to court, and couldn't hold you because of your position, and because of his distress, his difficulty, he couldn't hold you. What are you going to do now? Look at what she made it in Second Samuel chapter 19 from verse 16. And she made the son of Gera a Benjamite which was of Bahurim, hasted and came down with the men of Judah to meet King David. And there were a thousand men of Benjamin with him, and Ziba, the servant of the house of Saul, and his fifteen sons and his twenty servants with him. And he went over Jordan before the king. And there went over a ferry boat to carry over the king's household, and to do what he thought good. And Shimei, the son of Gera fell down before the king as he was come over Jordan and said to the king, Let not my lord impute iniquity unto me. Neither do thou remember that which thy servant did perversely the day that my lord king went out of Jerusalem, that the king should take it to his heart. For thy servant doth know that I have sinned. Therefore behold, am I come the first this day of all the house of, jo of Joseph to go down to meet my lord the king. That's restitution. David, I slandered you. Maliciously did I malign you. But if you think about it, you'll be, sorrow you'll be sorrowful, you'll be sad. Don't think about it. Don't take it to heart. I've sinned against you. Forgive me. I'm making restitution. I'm tendering my apology wholeheartedly. That's why I brought with me all my sons, all my servants, all the people that mattered in our family, just to beg you and to tell you I'm sorry for my foolishness. That's restitution. From the beginning of biblical revelation, God Himself had taught men and women. That if they are to worship him and follow after him, restitution was very necessary. Let's look at Ezra chapter 10 from verse 1. Now when Ezra had prayed and when he had confessed weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, they assembled unto him. Out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children. 
For the people wept very sore. And Shechaniah, the son of Jeiel, one of the sons of Elam, answered and said unto Ezra, We have trespassed against our God, and have taken strange wives of the people of the land. Yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this sin. Now therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives, that is, the strange wives, and such as are born of them, according to the counsel of my Lord. And of those that tremble at the commandment of our God, and let it be done according to the law. These people have been in exile. While they were in exile, away from the land of Israel, away from their temple and from their tabernacle, away from the priests of the Lord, they had gone to doing what the Lord told them not to do. They came back from exile, like backsliders that returned home. They realized at the time and in the state of their backsliding position, they had married wrongly. They had done things they shouldn't have done. And Ezra, when Ezra saw them, he broke down. He cried. He wept very sore. And he told them the truth. And so one of the people rose up and said, Oh yes, we accept Ezra. We have sinned. But there is hope. We can correct it. Therefore they made a covenant to put away all the strange wives, all the marriages they had done, according to the law of Babylon, but against the word of God. And they said, even concerning the children that are born, we'll need to listen to the counsel of my Lord. Just tell us the mind of God. We want to make restitution, but we're ignorant. We don't know the details of what we're going to do. But according to the counsel of my Lord, we tremble at the commandments of the Lord, counsel us, teach us, direct us. Verse 4, Arise, for this matter belongeth unto thee. We also will be with thee, be of good courage, do it. Then arose Ezra, and made the chief priests, the Levites, and all Israel, to swear that they should do according to this word, and they swear. In verse Ten. And Ezra the priest stood up and said unto them, Ye have transgressed and have taken strange wives to increase the trespass of Israel. Now therefore, make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers and do his pleasure and separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the strange wives. Then all the congregation answered and said with a loud voice, As thou hast said. So must we do. Verse 19. And they gave their hands. And they gave their hands. That they would put away their wives. That is the strange wives. Being guilty. They offered a ram of the flock. For their trespass. They saw they were guilty. They needed forgiveness. They needed the blessing of the Lord. And so they said. Lord will do what is right. Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel 33, from verse 14. Again, when I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, if he turn from his sin, and do that which is lawful and right, if the wicked restore the pledge, give again that he had robbed, walk in the way in the statutes of life, without committing iniquity, he shall surely live. He shall not die. If that wicked man, the moment he repents, the moment he comes back to the Lord, if he will restore the pledge that is some years ago, he had gone to take something from his neighbor's house as a pledge. You owe me. I take this property of yours as a pledge. That debtor eventually paid the debt. But this man did not restore the pledge. He held on to it. He has got his money. He's also keeping the pledge. Now he must make restitution. He must restore the pledge. Give again that which he had robbed. Anything he had stolen. Then will he live. So you can see that during the law. During the time of the kings. And during the time of the prophet. Repentance toward God. 
was always accompanied with restoration to a man of all the properties you had gotten from that man by fraud, by lying, or by pretense of whatever kind. The judges, the teachers, the leaders, the prophets and the kings in Israel preached and practiced restitution where necessary. And whenever it was possible, notice that, whenever it was possible. In the case of death, there was no way they could make restitution because they couldn't trace up the person and then give over the man that was dead. And those who committed such murder in the Old Testament, they sought forgiveness from the Lord, but there was nothing they could do about the one that had died. So there are cases like that. In the case of adultery, fornication, where the love has been taken away from the rightful husband, there was no way they could restore that love. And in such cases, there was nothing they could do. But in the cases of property, in the cases of something stolen, or slander, or injuring another fellow, God required that they will make right wherever possible, wherever necessary. And so must church leaders today preach it and teach it and practice it. Now, how about the New Testament? What are we supposed to do now? Or when Jesus came, did he change that? And say those Old Testament people are not supposed to keep on using stolen property. But now grace has come. If you've stolen any property, has he given us license to keep on using stolen property and not restore the stolen property to the rightful owners? Acts chapter 24 and verse 16. Herein and herein do I exercise myself. To have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man. Herein do I exercise myself, said the apostle. He had been saved, born again, forgiven all his past sins, sanctified, baptized in the Holy Ghost, had been called even to the position of an apostle. He knew the truth. Nobody knew sound doctrine like Paul the Apostle in the whole of the New Testament. And nobody defended the real gospel and the true gospel like Paul the Apostle in the whole of the New Testament. Nobody revealed the abolition of the Mosaic law like Paul the Apostle. But you know what he said? Paul the Apostle, with the knowledge of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul the Apostle, with the deep understanding and revelation of the grace of God, Paul the Apostle, knowing and understanding that the first covenant had been taken away, that the new covenant may be established, he said, even in this new covenant, even in this grace of God, even in the fullness of light of the revelation of the gospel, herein do I still exercise myself, always to have a conscience void of offense toward God. Isn't that enough? Once you as a child of God has a conscience void of offense toward God, isn't that enough? No, Paul the Apostle said, and toward men, men in the plural. Men, maybe your husband, men, maybe your employer, men, maybe your neighbors, men, all people everywhere that you have any interaction with, you have a, a conscience void of offense toward God to start with and toward everyone around you. Let's go back to Matthew, the very beginning of the New Testament. Matthew chapter 5, verse 23. Here is Jesus the Lord, full of grace and truth. What did he teach? What did he say? Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there remembers that thy brother has ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way, First, be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. That's Jesus teaching his own people. And if we are the people of Christ, the followers of Christ, the people who have received not only his sacrifice, but his teaching, not only his love, but his commandment, not only a place in heaven, but the way of the Lord that he revealed. Here is what we're listening to. He said, 
If thou bring thy gift to the altar, are we not still bringing gifts to the altar of the Lord today? Are we not presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice even today? And there you remember that thy brother has ought against thee. Leave there thy gift before the altar. You see, brothers and sisters, after we are born again, we still even offend one another. Some people think that restitution is only limited to what we did before we are born again. And today after we have been born again, husbands and wives may have little disagreement and the wife felt so offended, so put down, so distressed, so discouraged by the way the husband spoke. And maybe she started crying. Now you are born again, you are a child of God, but your wife is offended. What do we do? Do we leave her alone? Let Jesus comfort her. Let God comfort her. Jesus said, you come to the altar to offer your gift. Go to your wife and say, my wife, I'm sorry. Do not turn your backs on one another. Having malice, not greeting one another, settle the issue. And it says, be reconciled to your brother or to your wife, to your husband. After that, then you can come and offer your gift. Do you see people, so-called Christian, that will trample on the poor, trample on the weak, walk on their wives, and go to the pulpit to preach? No conscience, no tenderness, no remorse for making another person unhappy. And the wife had us not just one ought against them, but has many, many things that they are holding in the heart. They are almost pregnant with grudges. And yet this man will never think about it. He'll just grab his Bible and go on preaching. But Jesus said, go back to your wife. Go back to your husband. Go back to your friends. Go back to the fellow workers. Go back to the fellow members in the church. Go back to your neighbor. Go back to the co-worker. And reconcile with your fellow brother or sister. Then you can come back and offer your gift. In Luke chapter 17. From verse 3. Luke chapter 17. From verse 3. Take it to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times a day, and seven times in a day, turn again to thee, saying, I repent. Thou shalt forgive him. And the apostles said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. He wasn't talking to Pharisees. He wasn't talking to Sadducees. He wasn't talking to people under the law. He was talking to people enjoying the grace of God. He was talking to the apostles. And the apostles, when they heard that, they said, So that's still necessary? Increase our faith. He said, If your brother, apostle, if your brother, you're a Christian worker, if your brother, you're a child of God in the church, your brother does something against you. What's he to do? Is your brother supposed to say, well, we're children of God? The Bible says that if we confess our sins, it's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, I have prayed, God has forgiven me. Yes, but God has forgiven you. Your brother is still offended. Your sister is still sorrowful. The thing you did is still a burden upon the heart of your brother or your sister. What are you to do? You are to go back to him. Jesus said, if he comes back seven times in a day to this saying, I repent. My brother, I know I've sinned like Shimei. I know I've slandered you. I've injured you. I've done something wrong. I know you are unhappy and sad. I repent. Won't you forgive me? Jesus said, you may even discover if you are living together, if you are relating together, that you have said sorry today. And then another thing comes, comes up again. What do you do? Will you say, well, I, I can't be going back and saying I'm sorry, I'm sorry all the time. Nobody would even take me serious. Jesus said, go back again. You see Christianity? Do not allow any of those things to remain on your heart like a cloud that will come between you and the Lord. 
settle it. Settle the account. And even if you have to go back seven times in a day, apologize to your wife. Apologize to your husband. Apologize to the servant working with you. Apologize to the leader that is over you. Apologize to the people you work together in the office. Something has gone wrong. Before they even ask who did this, go and make right your way. That's Christianity. And the apostle said, Lord, we can't argue. Lord, we can't contradict what you are saying, but we need more faith to do that. Lord, increase our faith. And then in Luke chapter 19, from verse 8, And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. It is up there. The good works to do towards the poor will not make restitution then unnecessary. Then he said, If I have taken anything from any man by wrong accusation, I restore him fourfold. What did Jesus say? Did Jesus say, Zacchaeus, not necessary? When no more in the Old Testament? Zacchaeus, that's not important now. I am the Lord that forgiveth all sins. Don't talk about restitution now. Did Jesus say, Zacchaeus, no, once the Son of God has forgiven you, forget all about what you have done. No, Jesus said, that's all right. And Jesus said unto him, this day, is salvation come to this house, for as much also as is the son of Abraham. Philemon, Philemon, I'm reading from verse 10. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. Whom I have yet absent again, thou therefore receive him, that is my own bowels, whom I, have, I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in my bonds of the gospel. Now, Onesimus had been a servant of Philemon, as well as the relative, but he stole something, he did wrong, and he ran away. Then Paul the apostle preached to him. And he was converted, he came to the Lord. In the time of follow-up and counseling, Onesimus began to talk to Paul the Apostle, saying, Do you know what I was before? Do you know where I was before? Do you know what I did before? And then he revealed unto Paul the Apostle the evil that he had done. Oh, and Paul the Apostle said, You must make it right. Now you are born again. I have begotten you while I am in this prison. But now you must make right your life. In verse 15, for perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever, not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me, and how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Paul was telling Philemon, saying, You believe you are born again, so is Onesimus, he is now. A relative, a beloved brother in the Lord. And don't forget, Philemon, that this man is related to you also in the flesh. Verse 17. If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. Forgive him. If he has wronged thee, or owes thee aught, put that on my account. I, Paul, have written with it with mine own hand. I will repay it. I know, Philemon, that Onesimus has offended you, has stolen from you, but help him so that he can have a clear conscience before God and before man. Therefore, receive him back. He ran away, but get him back. He will still serve you. I've spoken to him. He will make right his life. Are you saying that he owes you something? How will he pay what he owes you? I think he will pay you. If he cannot pay you, put it on my account. Aged Paul, Apostle Paul, with the tent making that I'm doing, I'll find a way of paying you back what Onesimus is owing you. Isn't that restitution in the New Testament? So we have seen that even in the dispensation, under the dispensation of grace, wrongs against our fellow men, for which we can make amends, must be put right. You ought to restore where you have defrauded or stolen. We need to seek forgiveness from those who have slandered and injured. We need to pay back debts and make necessary confessions without covering up. 
Of course, as I've told you, restitution which will implicate other people or cause harm to somebody else's family needs care and counseling from ministers of the gospel who have maturity and godly wisdom. In conclusion, we need humility before we can apologize in the right manner and walk in the whole counsel of God. Therefore, we need to ask God for more grace to walk humbly before Him all the days of our lives. In Micah chapter 6 from verse 8 He has showed thee now, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God? The Lord's voice cries unto the city, The man of wisdom that shall see thy name. Hear ye the Lord, and who has appointed it. Are there yet treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked? And scant measure that is abominable? Shall I count them pure with the wicked balances and with the bag of deceitful weights? Is there yet stolen property in your house? Will God count you righteous, pure, holy? With those things that are there that you have not yet made restitution of, the Lord has showed you what He requires of you. Let's all go in humility before the Lord and ask Him for grace to do everything He expects us to do. Let's rise up and pray. Remember those who have been judged. Even in the house of God here, Your brothers, your sisters, your wife, your husband. Don't retain a hard heart. Let's all be humble before the Lord. He will forgive us. He will give us the grace to do right. You've cheated your employers. Make right your way. You've defrauded your neighbor. Make right your way. You have criticized and injured and slandered your fellow brother, your fellow sister. Make right your way. You have cheated your neighbors, your old past friends. Make right your way. Let's all have a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. The coming of the Lord is very near. Don't allow anything to stand between you and the pearly gates of heaven. Keep a clear conscience. Ask Him for grace. Ask Him for more help. The apostles said, Lord, increase our faith. We'll do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father, we thank you very much because of the word you have revealed to us. Thank you for the systematic way you have exposed us to your own mind as to this necessary step that we need to take after our conversion, after our repentance. Thank you for enlightening us and making us to know that it's not, it did not just start when the law came. It was in your mind right from the foundation of the world. And during the law, it was maintained. And during the time of Christ, it was maintained. Lord, Samuel of old, he thought with all his heart to have a clear conscience towards you and towards men. You commanded Abimelech to follow after this example. And Paul and other apostles in the New Testament followed after the same example. Lord, we require your grace. We require everything that you can give us so that we'll be able to walk according to the light you have given us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we do pray that after hearing this so clearly and so unmistakably, none of us, Lord, will go ahead and still be hard in our hearts, but will be humble enough to obey you in Jesus' name. Lord, we know that on the last day, 
if anything stands between us and you, we shall not be allowed into the pearly gates. But Lord, we don't want anything to stand. And we are asking that whosoever has anything to make right before the day of uh, the day of reckoning comes, grant us the grace to do so in Jesus' name. So that on the last day, when the roll shall be called, that none of our members, Lord, will have any odds reaching against him or her in Jesus' name. But Lord, we shall, we shall make our pastor happy after we have obeyed all that you have revealed to us through him in Jesus' name. But I thank you because we know you have answered us. We bless your holy name for such an opportunity to actually uh, hear and obey your word. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen.